three conversations about open data, an initiative by Land Information New Zealand. I'm Pallas Hupe Cotter, and we're coming to you today from Biz Dojo Collider Wellington in the capital city of New Zealand, which is also known as Windy Wellington. And I'll warn you, you're going to hear some of the wind behind us as we speak today. <laughs> Our final guest today joins us from the UK. It is Richard Sterling. He is the International Director of the Open Data Network, and we have uh, some information about him for you. On the ODI webpage, it says that he oversees ODI's International Delivery Network of Nodes, which we will explain to you, um, and as well as managing the ODI's successful startup incubator program, a big job. Richard is joining us from a pub, we've been told, so we're going to ask him about that. Um, how did you end up in a pub? We're in a, in a collider where we have lots of people collaborating, and how did you end up there, Richard? Uh, so I'm, normally I'm based uh, in London or uh, just outside, um, but I'm actually uh, in, uh, on the coast of Wales. So I'm in very, very rural parts uh, in Great Britain, and the internet is a bit patchy. So I have come to the only internet for about 30 miles. We certainly appreciate you. Like our guest last week, Beth Novak, Richard's been closely involved in the UK's government transparency and data initiatives, creating the strategy and implementation of open data in the UK, as well as advising the UK Prime Minister and Cabinet on public sector reform. So Richard, we've been asking each of our guests to kick this off with just your own definition of open data. So I, th I think open data is data that anyone can take, use and share. So it needs an open license, and it needs to be openly available. And where do they get that data? Who is providing that data? So at the moment, a lot of the data is provided by government, but you're starting to see a number of companies looking to open up their data as well. So um, when I say some companies, I mean com big companies like uh, Syngenta, uh, a multi large multinational which is opening up some of its farming data as part of their good growth plan because they want to be able to contribute back. They want to contribute into the sort of digital commons that people are building around uh, farming and agriculture data. But you also see it from uh, small companies. So some of the, the companies in our startup program, for example, are opening up data because they see that as part of their USB. They see that as part of what makes them different and why people should buy from them. Well, and that leads nicely into our second question, which is simply, why should we care about open data, the general public, the world at large? So open data is an amazing uh, new class of, of good. A, a lot of people have um, compared open data to sort of the new oil for the digital economy, um, which you know, some of those people have looked a bit like me, and uh, it's an analogy that works quite well. But I prefer, uh, recently I've been, I've been using the analogy of uh, data is a bit like roads. So in the same way as uh, a road gets you from A to B, data helps you navigate towards a decision. And um, just, sorry, up to you. You can continue, to navigate toward a decision, and you were continuing. <coughs> And um, like, like roads, uh, data is much more useful when it gets joined up. And the great thing about open data is it enables most people to uh, the most number of connections. Because you, it's really easy for people to use. It's, it's a free resource effectively. It's just a matter of knowing where to go and how to use it. And we'll get a little into that uh, further on in the conversation. I wanted to bring up a slide here, and it talks about the value of open data. And this is from a source called Shakespeare Review, and I believe this is from your uh, website, saying that open data has really translated into about 6.8 billion pounds of total value in the UK public sector. Now, how is that value measured? So there, there are a number of studies, uh, macroeconomic studies, that try and quantify the benefits of open data. As you say, there's the Shakespeare Review one. There was another study done by McKinsey. There was a study done by Lateral Economics around the G20. And they all uh, find the same positive uh, finding, that there is uh, open data brings benefits in the order of billions or trillions of pounds. And how and the in the world 
do we what what do we see? What are the tangible benefits? So that's through simple things like people uh, delivering goods uh, faster, cheaper, um, using things like uh, if, um, meteorological information, weather forecasts to um, minimize crop losses. It's through things like um, people. Everything happens somewhere. A lot of the information that's open is geographical information, so uh, it's it's about being smarter and taking a certain view of smart place. Okay, and that uh, leads us to the second point in that slide that we just showed you, that 84% of American smartphone users use an app powered by open data every single day. I understand geospatial data is very important, so mapping and things like that. This is what's, what people are using every day that they may not even equate with open data. Exactly, and we, 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 we sort of think about data in, of that sort as um, core data infrastructure. It's kind of the everything happens somewhere. So that's something that is a, a sort of core uh, asset, a core piece of infrastructure for the digital world. And you, if you look across a number of sectors, then those sort of core data sets keep coming up. Okay. And, and um, sorry, after you. Well, the, the core data sets, uh, I'm going to refer to something that's been in the news recently, which is FIFA, and the UK Prime Minister called for open data to be used to drive the reform of that particular institution, and that's an example a lot of people might understand or be able to visualize, but how does open data drive that? I'm very sorry, but the connection dropped halfway through your question. So sure. um, I, I, got, I got the UK Prime Minister, and then I got FIFA, but I lost everything in the middle. He is calling for open data to be used to drive reform of FIFA. So while people do understand, yes, FIFA needs reform, they may not be able to piece together how open data fits into that reform. So how is that? And this comes on to one of the key benefits of open data. Yes, it, it drives economic growth, and we've talked a bit about that. But it can also drive accountability and new accountability mechanisms. And in the case of uh, FIFA, if the money flows around FIFA had been open, then arguably you would not have seen the uh, type of behavior which is seeing Sepp Blatter be investigated at the moment. And in, indeed, I believe the French uh, Football Association was um, investigated over the weekend as well. Um, because if that, all of that data was open, all of it would have been available for scrutiny. And I would argue that you probably wouldn't have seen that behavior happen in the first place. Okay, thank you. Now, we do want to find out more about what the open data, net, or the ODI, I'll call it, just because it's easier to say. Yeah. Um, what is it, and what does it do? So the uh, ODI was created to kind of accelerate the benefits from open data, kind of answer the so what question. And um, as a result, what we do is we bring people together, convene them around problems. Those could be large multinationals, they could be startup companies, they could be academics, they could be government. And we, we try and get them solving real problems. And that could be, uh, we also look to um, build capability. So we have a, a, a training program that teaches people how to work with that uh, provides advice to large companies as well on how to best work with open data. Okay, you were dropping out there a little bit about uh, a little bit uh, halfway through it. I'm having similar dropout problems speaking today, but we do have a slide that sort of <laughs> explains what the Open Data Institute does. It is connecting, equipping, and inspiring people to innovate with data. So you said that could be large companies, it could be small companies, and, and what about with the government? How does ODI connect with the UK government? So we're a member of the the UK government's um, kind of advisory board into, on data. So we act as um, the sort of voice of the industry into the UK government. And it's uh, a privileged position, but it's one that we're very happy to do. 
take, taking the voice of the small companies right into the heart of the government. And that's very exciting, especially in the place from which we are broadcasting today, which is a collaborative environment for startups and, and other small companies that are trying to be nimble and innovative. Um, I'm going to pause right here and just make a call out to those of us who are watching us today. Please do send your questions at OpenDataNZ on Twitter, hashtag OpenDataLeadership. We'd love to be able to ask Richard your questions, as this is the third and the final uh, conversation that is your last chance to ask some of these international experts. And then I'll go back to this idea of nodes, which I mentioned in the introduction. Um, and it's a fascinating idea. Please explain to me what they are. And I understand this is generally your baby. Oh, I think we've, we've you see Richard frozen over there. I'm going to ask to pull up a slide about Some nodes. Richard, can you hear me? Yes, I can. OK, if you could start your explanation of nodes again. Oh, OK, great. <clears throat> so um, I've talked a lot about what the, the ODI does and um, ha how we're set up, largely talking to, to the what we do in the UK. And um, very early on in our life, we discovered that uh, even though we were we originally set ourselves up and sort of conceived of ourselves as a UK institution, that actually this was not sustainable, that there was the problems that we were seeing in the UK were problems that were being faced uh, around the world of thinking, well, there is open data, what, what's the uptake? There is open data, but what's the business use? How can we bring this new resource in front of people and explain why it's exciting? And our node network is our reaction to that. So we have set up a, a, a node network or a, a organizations around the world who want to act in a similar way to the Open Data Institute, who want to bring bring together a membership community, who want to teach people locally, who want to inspire people uh, to work with open data. And we now have a an international network which uh, spans the world. I think we have uh, one on, I think it's five continents now. Um, and 24 different uh, nodes around the world. Daily or yearly? Sorry, um, I think you were on mute for the beginning of your question. Uh, I imagine that it is growing, if not daily, then annually. Yes, yes. Uh, we take uh, a new sort of tranche of uh, nodes in every six months. So, okay, so... Um, it's so we have a, another slide, and I apologize, the delay is a bit difficult <laughs> to coordinate, but the slide describes nodes as a global network of physical premises and local expertise to develop sustainable data-driven business. So basically you have nodes are a place where people go, work with open data, and draw on the expertise of locals to see how to apply uh, knowledge about open data and also use the open data from the, the host country. Is that a correct interpretation? Absolutely, yes. Fabulous. Now, I'm going to ask you about another program which might tie into this. I don't know if they're hosted at Nodes, but it is the Leaders Network, and our land information of New Zealand's open data, open data program leader, Paul Stone, is a member of it. Can you tell me how the Leaders Network operates? Because I understand it's also sort of increasing those global cross-country ties and collaborations. Yes, so uh, the Open Data Leaders Network is another thing we've created to, uh, in response to the fact that open data is a sort of global movement. And when we uh, looked at this and we thought, well, it is a global movement, but a lot of the people who are implementing this are in, in central governments. There's a te small team of people who are publishing data. Um, or in a city, you know, there may be one or two people publishing data. And the challenges they're facing are similar, but within their own, they can, they can feel quite isolated. So we created the Open Data Leaders Network to bring those people together, physically bring them together for a week 
in London, bonding with uh, peers from around the world. Our last leaders network was uh, actually just a couple of weeks ago, where we had eight leaders uh, of open data movements from around the world, from diverse continents, from diverse backgrounds, some at city level, some at central government, all coming together, all sharing their experiences, and basically bond them, because that way they can then uh, bounce ideas off each other for the next 12 months. It's, it's, it's a genuinely amazing thing to see. And it's interesting that you use the word bonding because, in fact, Paul used that word describing it to me. He met with leaders from Argentina, Ecuador, Nigeria, Tanzania, and the Philippines. Uh, and he described mm -hmm. a scenario where it was in Nigeria where they were having a hackathon and they lost power. <laughs> and so, but it didn't stop them. They still continued because there's still so much to learn and share. And it also ties us in to another question I was going to ask you about um, really, well, about how you use open data. It doesn't have to be something that requires that technological um, equipment or infrastructure in a company. And, and we will get into that about how that, or in a country rather, and we'll get into that about how that applies in, in some of the Pacific countries who don't have as much investment in digital and technical infrastructure. Um, so we'll, I, I might just launch into that question right now because it is such a natural segue, and that is how can Pacific countries such as Samoa, Niue, or Papua New Guinea participate in the open data revolution when they have either limited or no digital infrastructure? So even if there is limited or no digital infrastructure, it is still perfectly possible to participate in the open data revolution. It doesn't require a huge amount of technology to um, make your data available. To be honest, some of the, the benefits from open data can be done through simple things like just putting the data up on the wall. Uh, I was in uh, a country earlier on, well, actually last year now, where they, had, they wrote up uh, in locations like how many crimes there had been. And that, that is simple offline open data because you still get those that change in accountability, that, that transparency about what's going on without having any technology involved. Now a simple step up from that is to um, have the, the data in a spreadsheet and publish it uh, to the, the web in a simple like Excel form or CSV um, on a, as a, a basic web server and taking that, that enables other intermediaries to come in and start working with that data. Now, those, those intermediaries, again, may not be the, the, the hackers in a hackathon. It might be the, the, the local journalists. It might be the local industry. But it's all about taking that data and making it available to other people to use, making, spreading the information around. And, and that's what uh, we had concluded, that the power is in the data. It is not necessarily in the digitalization of the data, although that certainly helps, and that's part of, of one of the things we're trying to accomplish, but it's in the data, the raw data itself. Um, it's about the insight. Uh, a point you're on in the call around... Um, data helping you to navigate, to, to be able to do... I'm afraid we're losing you. Do you want to start that answer again? Uh, okay, so um, I was uh, saying that the power is... Uh, agreeing with you that the power is in the data. Um, data is only useful if it helps you uh, navigate to a decision. And it's not the technology that does that. There's nothing, it's not a, a technological thing. Um, it is largely a um, cultural change. And uh, in making sure that you get the data in the right context. OK, thank you. Now, I'd love to talk a little bit about incubators, because uh, as I understand, you've been involved in some. So tell us about how ODI incubates new open data to help start up businesses, and what have been some success stories so far? Programs, um, which I'll, I'll talk about. Um, they all have slightly different, slightly different aspects. 
The first is for very early stage ideas. It's kind of starting to go beyond the hackathon because that we'd see, we observed that there were lots and lots of hackathons uh, which generated a lot of excitement and buzziness and ideas and people got excited. But uh, they didn't really generate any sustainable solutions. So we um, created a, a new process, uh, a challenge series, which had um, a, a deliberative engagement between the data publishers and some of the sort of big players in a sector to try and identify what the big problems that could be solved with data. Published those, took a six month window with the data supporting for teams to co coalesce around problems and um, start working on their ideas, have a hack weekend at the end just for them to polish it, and then uh, sort of went from 30, 40 ideas down to um, th three who made it through to the next stage. They got a small grant and some support from uh, and PwC. And then that was an intensive period of about a month. And then there was a final winner who got um, some seed funding. And that's, that, that uh, is one of the few open data programs that I know of that has, uh, has a defined return on investment because we evaluated it at the end. And we had a 10 times ROI. So that, that sort of taking early stage idea, uh, going from conception through to proto company. The next stage is uh, our in-house incubator program where we take early stage companies or sort of two, so between sort of two and five employees and they, they must be working with open data and solving real problems. So what, you know, we, we uh, sort of adopt and sign up to the O'Reilly phrase, you know, work on stuff that matters. And that's kind of what we did, the startups we try and try and pick. And uh, we provide them with support, with um, peer networking. You'll see, you'll see a recurring theme in uh, what the ODI does, try and jo join people together. And uh, mentors. And aim to grow the company up from the sort of two to five person size to maybe about the sort of 10 person size. And to give you a flavor of some of the companies that are working on that, there is, uh, they're as diverse as uh, an accountancy, uh, on, an online accountancy ser uh, service, which uh, publishes aggregate data on um, the, the sort of financial status of small businesses. So you can bench, if, if, if you're a uh, greengrocer, say, you can benchmark yourself against the average greengrocer. And that's their sort of open data angle. Um, a peer-to-peer peer -peer energy market. So um, pe people reselling uh, green energy that they have uh, generated direct to, the, to other consumers. And uh, one that's looking at disrupting the rental markets. So uh, RentSquare, um, which is looking to act as a direct broker between uh, tenant and landlord. And again, is publishing data about the state of the rental markets um, as, as they go. The, the third tip is, um, comes after that, which is a virtual incubator, uh, which we're running across Europe. And uh, there we offer a 100,000 euro direct investment, as well as continuing to provide coaching. Um, but that's that sort of comes afterwards. So you have um, one stage going from idea to proto company, a stage going from proto company to um, something that is is real, it's tangible. You know, people are, are paying the bills, and then a stage to uh, help people scale up. Okay, I had come across Brightbook, Sensei, Thinkful. Can you tell me a little bit about those companies and where they are on that spectrum that you just described? Yes. So those. Um, Brightbook is uh, in the, the sort of the middle of those tiers, and that's the accountancy company that I was talking about. Okay, okay. Um, Sensei and Thinkful are um, kind of on the cusp between the, the final um, internet of things 
talk a bit more about um, Thinkful in more detail. And uh, Thinkful wants to be a platform for all the sensors, uh, all of the sensors in the Internet of Things. So um, they want to make sure that everything can talk to everything else. And not a small goal. That's a really interesting. <laughs> no, not a small goal at all. Uh, if you if if you meet the founder, you'll understand. He's a, he's a man who has global vision. Um, this is uh, probably the uh, second or third company he will have taken to um, that sort of level. Uh, he sold his last one a few years back. Um, so this is this 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 is something that I think is is going to be going to be huge. Uh, but the reason I said it's on that cusp is uh, the point when they joined, they had a team of uh, about five. They're now up to um, I think about sort of eight to ten people. They've just successfully applied for the uh, the fine the final stage that I was mentioning with the hundred thousand uh, investment and a sort of six-month period to uh, go and help scale their company. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm expecting I'm expecting to hear great things and to feel very sad that I don't have an equity stake in any of the in uh, <laughs> in, in any of these companies fairly soon. True, you could say. However, I was there when they were just starting out. So we need to keep an eye and ear out for Thingful. That's what you're saying. Exactly. Now, you talked about the Internet of Things, and that leads into another question about the difference between a sensing city and a smart city, which is, uh, I know what, what cities around the world, I understand that Auckland, Christchurch, and Wellington are working together to create themselves as, or recreate themselves as smart cities. So can you explain the difference between the two? So I'll have a go, although... Um Uh, loaded and um, by, by vendors a bit, but I would say that the difference between a sensing city and a smart city is in the, the difference in analytics. So a sensing city generates a whole bunch of data, and it may be data about air quality, it may be data about traffic that's there. Um, a smart city then takes action on the back of that data. So it may be that the traffic data and the air quality data at certain times of day to minimize the impact of air pollution, or indeed do the opposite and uh, make all the, all the traffic lights green on the main thoroughfares at uh, peak times. So you smooth the flow across the city. Now that's the sort of thing that you can only do if you have the data, so you need the sensors, but you also need the analytics capability. You also need the, um, the ability to to react in real time. And then there's, I'd say there's a, a, a stage beyond that, which is um, using the uh, sensor data and the, 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 the analytics um, and starting to move on to a predictive modeling. Because at that, that point, you can start getting ahead of your problems. And I use traffic because it's an easy one to understand, but you can start applying areas of city management including some of the wicked problems in public policy. Okay, and I, I want to throw in one um, that Paul Stone uh, here at Land Information New Zealand brought up, and he used the example of a parking space, and there can be passive sensors that say, okay, all the parking spaces are full, but that would be a sensing city concept. Yep. A smart city concept would be, okay, it's full, but we know that that car has been there almost two hours, so in ten minutes that space will become free. So it is this, this application of predicting future behavior and using the analytics to back up that prediction. So passive versus active is how I summarized it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think this, again, is from your website. It describes any urban area that uses technology to enhance people's lives uh, and that vendors are often promising to use this sort of uh, data and offer technical solutions or technological solutions to make the sort of chaos of cities more successful. And I understand that in that arena where the vendors have gotten involved, there's some, there's some gray area there that, that not all have the appropriate solutions. Is that correct? Very sorry, I'm, I'm, I, you broke up again, so I just 
missed your question. Not a problem. We are going to have this problem throughout, so we'll just work around it. I said the um, the from the website there was a quote that talked about smart cities and how there are now vendors in that space offering technological solutions to help solve or improve the chaotic um, motions, everyday machinations of cities. So, but there is some issue with some of those vendors because they're, sometimes their solutions are imperfect. Yes. So uh, you're absolutely right there. And it's, but this is true of every early market. You know, the, I think what, what is true is that over the, over the last five to ten years, a lot of cities have gone to the stage of being a, a sensing city. So they have uh, sensors that are generating data. That, um, so there are now reams of, of data about what's going on in the city. It's only in the last couple of years people have been trying to turn that into insight and turn that into predictive modeling. And nobody's really cracked it yet. Even if you talk to some of the, the smartest cities in the world, there are still large parts of that which uh, are, are yet to be, to be solved. And as a result, none of, the, none of the vendors have solutions which are perfect. They all have, or a, a number of them have things that are really interesting or have um, proven ROI in certain circumstances. And the other challenge that everybody faces is the rate of growth and the rate of progress in the technology is enormous. What was the state of the art just 12 months ago isn't today. And cities are big. You know, these contracts go on for a long time. It's incredibly hard for people to know or, or to, to be able to buy with confidence, to know that they're buying something which will stand the test of time or will they won't have kind of buyer's regret in 12 months um, because often these are also quite big systems and they're quite pricey. Um, so I, I, interesting space for people to go into sort of buying almost like an, an agile solution, a solution which can change over time, which is slightly more modular and um, you almost buy the upgrades as you, or you, you, you build in an upgrade part and the fact that technology will change. Yeah, well, that makes perfect sense. Um, we talk about some of the, the challenges, and one of the challenges that I came up with when I was researching this is something called open data knots, and we do have a slide to describe that. Um, open data knots, as we have sort of summarized it, and you can correct or add on to, are, are self-perpetuating problem with knowing what open data to release and what open data to request. And so the example is the owner of the data says, I do not know what data you want, so I do not know what to give to you. The user says, I do not know what data you have. It sounds like a Dr. Seuss book. So I do not know what to ask you for. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, something we were uh, chatting about in my team uh, just, just today, um, because it's a recurring problem. The good news is I think it's a problem which can be solved through conversation. Um, the best way of having, uh, of cutting through a problem like that is get both sides in a room together and get them talking around a particular problem. So um, in the case of, uh, you know, it, it may be something like environmental information. So let's pick a problem that, we, we both, that both sides care about in the sphere of environmental information. And then let's get, get everybody into a room face to face and just talk about it. And through the process of that conversation, then both sides will understand more about what, the, what, what, is, what is possible. And then, then we can start cutting through that, that sort of open data knot and start getting some progress. And it's probably not going to be the thing that uh, both sides expect from day one. It's going to be something on the edges. Uh, or something which is seen as less contentious um, because that's where you can make early progress and you can start showcase, showcasing um, the wins which helps build confidence on both sides and helps you make the progress towards something that might be more totemic. Or it may even be that actually when you talk about it then the thing that everybody was at the table 
Um, so in the UK, for example, um, we were through this taking this type of proce process, we were able to open up um, information around river flow and flooding because it was a, such a big problem yeah. that it just like, okay, this is an obviously part of the solution. We've got to do this today because if we don't do it today, we'll regret not having started. And this sort of conversation, you know, you described being in a room. Uh, I know that the Open Data Program here in New Zealand just recently held a, a meeting, and the sign on the door was Open Data Geeks, and it was essentially trouble, troubleshooting through some of these knots, troubleshooting to where things were getting jammed yeah. up. Um, and then there's an online conversation, a continuing online conversation through a series of emails. So um, there can be different ways to, to interface. Uh, speaking of online, I will also once again suggest to anyone who's watching today to please email us your questions at OpenDataNZ, hashtag OpenDataLeadership. So when we talk about open data, and once we get that unjammed and the flow going, in what areas do you see the Open Data Institute's work with Open Data having the potential to make the most exciting impact in the world? Where do you see the impact of the ODI, specifically the, the work that ODI is doing? So I think that uh, the impact for the, of the ODI can be seen actually around the world. If I just wanted to pull out a few examples. Um, so I'll, I'll do one from the UK, one from Africa, and then uh, I'll probably pick out one from Asia. So the one, the example from the UK, um, work we did in helping release flooding information, because I've kind of alluded to that. I'll instead highlight um, our summer showcase, which we ran last year. Now this was a program we ran for a couple of months over the summer, saying, do you have a really interesting open data program or a project, particularly small amount of money, um, and think that the ODI can help? Well, let us know. And that threw up some really interesting projects. For example, it's uh, one air quality around our major. This is something which has been. Okay, Richard, I think we're losing you, and I think you're saying something about air quality around a major city. Is that correct? Oh, dear, we might uh, <laughs> might have lost him for good now. We'll have to see. Once again, he's coming to us from Wales in a pub, so it's not surprising that we should have a little delay here. And I think I'll actually bring up something that I had wanted to mention at the end, uh, something suggested by our guest last week, uh, Beth Novak. It's a new website. It's actually in beta, and it very much ties into this question. It's how open data is changing the world. And you'll see the four different ways, improving government, empowering citizens, creating opportunity, and solving public prog problems. The website is http colon backslash backslash odimpact.org. And we'd love for you to be able to visit that and provide some feedback. Again, that's under um, the GovLab, uh, under Beth Novak and Joel Goring. And I think we do have Richard back now. Are you with us, Richard? I am, yes. Okay, great. So you were giving us some examples of impacts, and all we got was something about a uh, summer showcase and something about air quality near a big city. Yes. Uh, so one of the – I was going to give you an example from the UK, an example from Africa, and an example from Asia. Um, the example from the UK was the summer showcase, and um, air quality and particularly Heath, uh, expansion of Heathrow has been a big – big issue uh, for us in the UK. Um, it's something that we have failed to take a decision on for about 25 years, as anybody who's traveled through Heathrow can probably tell. Um, we really need to expand it and make it a bit bigger. And one of the, the, the questions has always been around the air quality around near Heathrow and the impact on the people who live there, because it's a really populated area. So we uh, funded a small project to put um, little air quality sensors in the houses around Heathrow to form a community of people from the residents 
uh, around those air, air quality sensors, um, so sharing results between them, publishing it all as open data, and enabling much more granular uh, information to be taken. Because while the, the air quality sensors weren't hugely high quality, there were lots of them. So you could start using the, the, the fact there were lots of sensors to take really accurate readings and almost draw out contour lines of the pollution. Now this was, um, th this, this fed in directly to the debate around whether or not Heathrow could be expanded. Because the day after all of this uh, data was released and published as open data, it was, uh, the work was cited in the Houses of Parliament and uh, the debate changed. Now, I, I can't say that uh, with any great certainty that there was that this is definitely due to the work that uh, was done by another of our, our startups, uh, OpenSensors.io. But it was quite spooky how the conversation changed just the day after. So I think that, that that's a lovely example of open data impact. Um, from the UK, and also a lovely example of how open data can help bring people together around a problem. And it's uh, in democratic participation, which is something that our previous guest, Beth, no Beth Novak, is very, very passionate about. So that you, you know, it used to be the only way you could be heard is by voting, essentially, or maybe speaking yeah. up at a council meeting. But now you can actually provide solutions from the public, you know, or from people using open data to city councils, and 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 see policies changed if indeed that's what happened in this case. It's exactly, um, and actually, there's a. One, one of the, the people on my team uh, last year did something similar in Japan around uh, the, the, the terrible events of the nuclear reactor there. Um, he drove around um, taking Geiger counter readings um, from lots and lots and lots of different spots, like using really cheap Geiger counters, um, and used that to uh, map out the contour maps around radiation um, around the nuclear reactor. Around the, the, and if you remember at the time, the Japanese government was, um, and the, the reactors were very, they were trying, they were locking down the information, they weren't sharing it, um, mm -hmm. all of the readings were very broad, uh, and he was able to um, bring a degree of uh, greater accuracy, and also show how the radiation was drifting, in a way that just wasn't possible before, using these, um, I think you, you could almost say it's like a citizen science approach. You know, so you have mass participation, you have huge numbers of readings, and you're then able to do some really quite scientific work on the back of it. So you also said that you had impact uh, stories from uh, Africa and Asia, I believe. Yes, so the African example is uh, based around Burkina Faso. So Burkina Faso is a, a, a it's a very small com uh, country in uh, the west coast of Africa. They've had, uh, I think at one point they were the second poorest country in the world, according to the UN. And they've, ha they've had uh, a relatively um, lively political history in the last couple of years. Um, so there's been a, uh, there was a couple of revolutions and they held uh, democratic elections. Uh, last year, and I think I've lost you again. You still there? I'm still. I am still here. <laughs> okay. No, that's great. Uh, your picture froze, so I wasn't sure. Oh. <laughs> and uh, the um, so the, the democratic elections last year, we were able to um, bring together the electoral monitors, the government, some uh, civil civic tech organisations like my society, and provide real time data on how the election uh, results would come to, which we would argue um, would the uncertainty as to what was going on in the election and meant that everybody could see that it was a fair and, un and unbiased uh, result in, re in near real time. So you could watch on social media the, pe the period after the ballots closed but before the results came out and the sort of tension was rising. Mm. And then uh, as the results started coming out, uh, then it just subsided and disappeared again. 
um, which is an, a genuinely amazing thing and is a great example of how open data can help support democracy and the, the proper operation of democracy. Because none of the apparatus changed. It's just the data was available really quickly. There's nothing more tense and uncertain than not knowing, and that information can literally calm people who are in that fight, flight, or freeze mode, which is what happens so often, uh, which you described as tension. So that's Africa. What about Asia? And the example that I would give in Asia is, um, is well, uh, so um, there I want to talk about the work we've been doing with uh, the Malaysian government. So the Malaysian governments, um, they're relatively new to open data. They, it's not something which is uh, sort of they they that sort of natural uh, tendency. Um, there. And what we've been able to do is help them uh, understand how opening up some data can really unlock innovation, can help them solve some of their big problems. And they've been, I'm, I'm really quite, really very happy with the, the progress they've made around releasing data and starting to use it to solve real problems that their people face. So one of the, the examples that I use a lot with them is uh, a dengue fever uh, and mapping of the outbreaks because we were talking earlier around the shift from um, just being uh, reactive to being proactive and using predictive modeling and something like dengue fever it's very responsive to that type of analysis and they have some amazing data scientists in the universities so if they if they the, if the government takes the information they have around the the sites that uh, of the outbreak and the reported cases going through the medical system and shares that uh, suitably anonymous so you're not disclosing any personal information with the universities with the analysts then they can do uh, they can start they'll have open models as to where uh, dengue fever is happening they can start using that to form public in uh, outbreak. Uh, in, in public information broadcasts and also use uh, use it to feed into the preventative spray. So that just brings up Zika in my mind. Is open data being used with Zika, the Zika virus? As far as I know it isn't yet, although I would I think it really ought to be. Mm -hmm. Particularly given the um, rapid spreads that seems to be going on and the closeness of the Olympics. Precisely. Uh, well, there's that idea out there. Now it's out there. Let's see what happens. So Absolutely. We've talked about Africa and the Pacific, and we'll get down to sort of our area of the Pacific. How would New Zealand benefit from participating in the ODI? Well, I personally, I think uh, news, news, I've been following the debate in New Zealand for a number of years, um, and because I've met various people both from government and from outside uh, conferences for a few years and I feel like the open data movement in New Zealand is going pretty well. Uh, you've got some great talent. The trick will be in seeing some of the ideas turn into sustainable businesses and sustainable organizations and I think there's a, a lot of the the sort of sharing of experiences across countries will be beneficial there because um, it's the approach that works in uh, each country is slightly different and what makes it effective or ineffective is slightly different in each case because the cultural context is, is different and I think this can be learned in sharing what what worked in the UK, what worked in Canada, what worked in the US, what worked in uh, Asia, what worked in Africa, what worked in uh, Australia. It, it, there's just a huge amount of learning in that. And if we all share that inf information and that learning, then we'll be able to be effective that much faster. So that's really the key, you think. Any other keys to unlocking the potential of New Zealand in this data sphere or open data sphere? So I, I know that Paul and his team are already doing a lot to engage 
with the, the community and um, things like your the, the data geeks night that uh, happened the other day um, but I also think that uh, through trying to I identify the key problems across sectors and identify the key data sets that underpin those sort of work, working out what is the data infrastructure for the digital in New Zealand that will help prioritize the work because one of the challenges that open data faces is it is so broad and it touches so many areas that it can be a bit conceptual and a bit difficult to um, really drive as a public official but through taking a f focusing in on sectors you can start identifying problems and you can start making it tangible and you can then start putting uh, like hard deadlines around things uh, which makes it much easier to get get your arms around Great. Well, thank, thank you for that perspective. And I'm going to surprise you with this question. It's one that I've asked the other two, and I, I like to give a little heads up before we start, but since you were racing around trying to find <laughs> Wi-Fi, you didn't have the benefit of that. But if you were going to describe your ideal day in an open data-driven world, what would it look like morning to night? So uh, my ideal open data day or data-driven day I'd probably uh, wake up nice and early at an optimum time driven by uh, some sort of biometric uh, device. So either a, uh, something something like a Withings watch or um, equivalent thing, but sort of woken up at the appropriate time. I'd get an alert on my phone as to what the weather was going to do uh, over the course of the day, um, telling me the optimum time to go for a bike ride, uh, do some nice data analytics in the morning, uh, go for the bike ride and then I don't know yeah probably uh, drive to the best local restaurants uh, with decent hygiene ratings all driven <laughs> through public reviews and uh, open health inspection data uh, fabulous yeah well thank you you played you played along quite well I certainly appreciate that and I am going to thank you I know that you're um, Probably it's going to get quite loud in this pub quite soon, so <laughs> we were lucky, lucky to have a nice quiet time. So Richard Sterling, uh, thank you so much for joining us from Wales today, but representing the Open Data Institute in the UK. And I also would love to um, just put our slide up there showing what we're talking about today, or Richard's slide, so that he doesn't he can be, he can be set free. And I'll thank you, um, because I'd like to say a few other thank yous before we wrap up this third in a series of three conversations. So I should say cheers to you, Richard. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you for everyone who's been joining us in and during these three sessions. I'd also like to thank a few individual, well, people and organizations. One, the Biz Dojo Collider Wellington, where from where we have been broadcasting, where they're collaborative startups and uh, work partnerships going on. Also, I'd like to thank you to Mike Riversdale, who has been the guru behind the scenes, and in his place, Divya Chen One Christian. Krishnan. I knew I was going to trip that up, Divya, but I got Divya right. And then, of course, Rochelle Stewart, Allen, and Paul Stone from the Open Data Program at Land Information New Zealand. The point of these conversations was really to drill down to why should we care about open data. And hopefully through the three conversations, those of you who have been watching have understood its value, its impact, what it is even. And once you understand it, it's very easy to get excited about what open data can offer to not only your community but your country and around the world. Real solutions that will make this, as we said in our first, something that impacts our world almost as much as the invention of the World Wide Web. So if you've become someone who's been converted to the value and importance and significance of open data, then please do become an open data champion. Spread the word tell people about it, tell people about what land information is doing through its open data program and, and let your public officials know as well. Uh, it's something we all need to know more about and we need to become activists for. So on behalf of myself, Palace Hupe Cotter, I am very pleased to have been a part of this and I thank you all for joining us. Go out there and live your ideal open data driven day. I hope it happens sooner rather than later. Goodbye everyone. <laughs>